Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Well, here we are. It's time for another podcast. And uh, I'm Phil. And I'm Laura. Still here. <laughs> Hanging on by a thread. <laughs> Actually, we probably don't need to introduce ourselves, do we? No. Because, well, at least... Oh, no, I think we should. At least I can't... Yeah, I mean, I couldn't be Laura and you... Well, I mean, no, actually... OK, minefield, don't say anything. Move no, on. don't say anything, because you just had me a mug. Because I could be Laura. And I know you're Phil, and you're best friends with your cat, Larry. Yeah. Which um, I do love. Who I haven't seen for a day or two. And this is the most incredible mug I've ever seen. So, mm. Uh We are... Um, because that was quite an abstract beginning, and that's quite appropriate, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> because we're going to talk about an abstract painting today, uh, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon by mm-hmm. Pablo Picasso. By way of introduction, uh, one of our exhibition on screen films was called Young Picasso, a film I directed uh, oh, because of COVID, you lose track, but 2019. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I'd, I'd, I'd want, I guess it's kind of obvious that you'd want to make a film about Picasso, but um, you've got a couple of obstacles. Three, actually you've got three obstacles with Picasso. Right. First obstacle is that there have been a lot of films made about him and you don't want to just repeat what everyone else has done. Second obstacle is that because he died within 70 years, you know he's going to be very expensive because of copyright. And the third obstacle is that when you start looking at his life, it is so remarkably full that you simply cannot do him justice in 90 minutes. Um, now, I faced this problem before, Beethoven, yeah. Mozart, but even with those two, and it was really difficult. You know, you're cutting a symphony down to three minutes or an opera down to 30, I don't know, two minutes. But even there, the both films are two hours, two hours five, two hours 15 um, and at one point with Beethoven, we had a ten and a half hour cut. <laughs> oh, okay. um, Was that because of the music? Yeah, because of the music. We, I filmed a lot of music for that. Anyway, mm. so what I decided to do was to make a film called Young Picasso because I think that often with artists, one of my not discoveries exactly, but one of my conclusions after having made a lot of biographies is that people are pretty well formed by the time that they're 19 or 20. So our kids, for example, I suspect that in 20, 30 years, their essential core character will not have changed that much. They'll have had plenty of experiences and, the, you know, this could be wrong. <laughs> but actually Mozart, Beethoven, Monet, I mean, I could, you know, could go on and on. Pretty much a lot of their defining characteristics are there by the end of their formative years. And that's why it's so important to look at what has formed them. And that's their society and their parents and their education. And Now, in the case of Picasso, we obviously go a bit further. We go to 1900... And, well, sorry, the way, where, what I did with young Picasso was I led up to the painting of Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. And that marks, as far as I'm concerned, the end of his youth, the end of young Picasso. And how old was he when you painted it, roughly? Well, he painted it in 1907. Mm. And I have to remember... He was born... He was 26. When was he born? 1881. 1881. So, yeah, he's 26. Yeah, I I mean, I'm not quite sure the month, so he's going to be around 26. Mm. And... You know, he's been through something called the Blue Period, which has some beautiful paintings. But there are those that would say this is his first masterpiece. Um, And it is an extraordinary painting, which is in the Met in New York. It's also interesting because it's one of those paintings that I know a good number of people who would look at it and go, oh, I don't like that. Oh, Uh, that's ugly. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, not for me. But again... As we've talked about on the podcast, give it, give it, a, give it a chance. Try to understand what he's doing, um, and you know, look at the, you know, start to understand the textures and the layers and the levels, and uh, and I, I think the, the painting will, 
you know, be much more rewarding as a result. I, I love every single painting we've done. Well, wow, that's good. <laughs> that's a good start. But that's only because I've never really looked at them all. So I'm not sure what I've done with my life. <laughs> well, I definitely haven't been looking enough, have I? Because I've definitely, I have been again to New York. So I must have walked past this painting at some stage in my life, if it's been there that long. Sorry, um, it's not at the Met. What am I talking about? Yeah, I thought it was. MoMA. MoMA. Oh, okay. At MoMA. Oh, sorry. All those people that have started emailing Writing and texting in, in the going last mad. Okay, so I didn't seconds. walk past it then. That's handy. Sorry, it's at MoMA. Okay. Museum of Modern Art. Right. Which is indeed where we filmed it. And it's quite, it's a big painting. It's got, it's, it's the only painting on, on its wall. Um, in fact, it's one of the rare paintings at MoMA, which is, I think it's correct to say that since they bought it, it has been hanging. Oh, so you know, these galleries, sometimes they have thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of artworks that just never get seen because they are, yeah. they just don't have the wall space. Um, but sometimes they get bequeathed whole collections or sometimes, you know, for whatever reason. Um, so... From time to time, a, a gallery will do a complete rehang or a partial rehang, and some paintings come down or paintings come in and out of favour. This painting has been on the wall of MoMA since it was it was bought. Um, I have to try and remember, but in the 40s, I think. And it's never going to come down? No way. Very unlikely. Yeah. Um, now. This one's a big deal, isn't it? Yeah, it's, well, it's considered to be a big deal, and I think it probably is a big deal. He, greatest artist of all time, I don't know, but he's he's one of them. Yeah. Enormously prolific. I mean, yeah. if you try to do a breakdown of all the artworks of Pablo Picasso, you are into the tens of thousands. You know, when you make a film about Vermeer, well, let's talk about the Leonardo that we did, 22 works right. that exist. Well, that's actually... 22 paintings, uh, Vermeer, what is it, 35, 36 paintings. So, you know, you start thinking about Picasso, tens of thousands. Yeah, so we could probably definitely do some more of his paintings later then. And Yeah, oh, no question. And, I mean, there was an, uh, an exhibition at the Tate recently which was just one year oh, okay. of his life. Yeah, I never, I, never, I never got to that. I would have liked to have got to that, actually. I actually anyway. think sometimes, you know... You have to allow yourself to think something isn't that good. You know, just because it's hanging on the wall of a gallery doesn't make it something you necessarily have to mm. like. Well, I suppose, okay. So there's going to be a one time I'm not going to like one, but so far I'm loving them. And actually fated one, didn't he, based on the death of Morat? Did he? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, which I got really excited about. So a copy of? It's a painting because he was out arguing with his wife at the time. And it's making her look like a monster uh, going to stab him. Yeah. Uh, okay. So maybe we come back to it another time. Okay. Because when I was looking at looking at all these things, maybe Google had heard me mention the death of Marat because I don't ever talk about things like that. It just popped up. And it up. came up, yeah. <laughs> and of course, I was really excited because now when I'm talking with everybody about paintings all the time and getting on everyone's nerves oh, with all sure my knowledge. No, they like it, but it's a bit like, oh my God, what's happened to Laura? Where is she gone? <laughs> Normally I'm talking about bands. <laughs> Laura, I'm talking about paintings What's going all on? the time. <laughs> Where's the music chat? <laughs> so, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon mm. is actually not about women from Davignon, Avignon in France. Uh, it is. Uh, it refers to a, a street in Barcelona, Um and or Avignon, the street was called Avignon. Calle, well, I just have to say in Catalan, I guess. But in Spanish, it'd be Calle de Avignon. And um, I think in Spanish, that would be something like Calle, I don't know, d'Avignon in, in Catalan. And it was a brothel and a brothel that he visited. And these are the women of that brothel. Um, originally, there were... It's one of the kind of interesting parts of this painting. There were, in fact, two male um, visitors to the brothel, but he's painted them out. Um, Why do you think he painted them out? Any ideas? 
Uh, I think he painted them out because, in some senses, they get in the way of the story. Okay. Because all of a sudden, this way you have women who are confronting you very directly with their gaze. Mm -hmm. And I think if you've got two men who, with their backs to you, yeah. looking at them, mm -hmm. um, then it's 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 it, the connection between you and these women is is somewhat interrupted. Um, I also think that um, as we're going to talk about. The influence, he, he suddenly became in, in, interested in um, Iber, uh, Iberian and African art, partly because he went to a particular museum in Paris of African art. So those two masks that mm. you see. Yeah. Um, and I think he, he, he wanted this, you know, you needed the space to, to kind of put, put that in as well. Um, jumping forward a little bit to the... To, you know, he paint well. So Picasso, there are three key cities in Picasso's life. So you've got Malaga, you've got Barcelona, and you've got Paris. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the questions of the film, really. Why does this little kid born in Malaga, why him? Why does he become arguably, well, arguably certainly the, one of the greatest artists of the 20th century, if not of all time? And so we look at that in the film and we look at what Malaga was. Very importantly, his father was an art teacher um, and he, he was an artist. He was OK. But what, what, why that was important was that he was teaching in art colleges and he could always get his son in. OK. So it was the beginning of Picasso's education. Now, mm. it's so easy with these kind of great artists to kind of get fixated on them as older men or older women and, you know, imagine that it was all predestined that they would end up where they ended up. Obviously, it's not true. And the young Picasso, the young kid, um, he had an absolute passion for it. But he, he realised very early on, and his father influenced him to, re to realise, helped him realise, that you had to study. Right, OK. Now, if you go to the wonderful Picasso Museum in Barcelona, it's fantastic... There are lots of paintings in there that he did as a young man where he's copying other artists. So he's gone into the, to the Prado, for example, in Madrid, and he's copied a Velázquez as carefully as he could. So it's not, it's not kind of, it's not, it doesn't look like a Picasso, quote unquote. He's trying to work out how, Picasso, how Velázquez painted. There's a copy of a Van Gogh, for example. Right. So he's learning his craft. Right, yeah. Um, the first time, really, when he starts to go out, go go for it on his own, is the so-called blue period, and then there's also a rose period. Um, even there, he's influenced by other artists, other Catalan artists. Um, but every artist around about the nine, you know nineteen hundreds wanted to go to Paris. Right. Yeah. Um, so famously, Picasso and his friend bought themselves these two brown corduroy suits. Got on the train, probably third class. It was certainly wasn't first class. Turned up in Paris, at the, the, the Gare d'Orsay, which is now the Musée d'Orsay. And, but they were they were just two of hundreds and hundreds of artists that wanted to become famous. Now he had very little money, so up in the reason they all went to Montmartre, yeah, was that it was really cheap. Mm -hmm. P Picasso lived in this. Extraordinary place, which was on the side of a hill. So you walked, it's like one story on one side, but then it was like, I can't remember how many, three or four stories on the back. Okay. It was almost like on a... On a cliff. On, yeah, on a, on a bluff kind of thing. Okay. But it was a ramshackle old wooden place where the water was outside, and but that was where his studio was. Yeah. And there were other artists there and all sorts of people were coming and going. Um, they would sometimes watch more famous artists walk up the street and they would kind of, you know, almost, you know, catcall them, you know, you might have Monet walking past or, <laughs> you know, and they might just make, take the mickey out of him or something or Manet or something yeah, yeah. like that. Um, As you do. Uh, but also... Throw he, a bit of paint at him. Yeah, they would throw stuff. A little brush. But also he, um, 
Bear in mind that he couldn't really speak French very well, so it was like a, a Spanish community. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, but in this studio, which was pretty ramshackle, and we have an account of it, um, jumping forwards to when he's painting this picture, he, he paints this picture, and you know he, he, he keeps he doesn't let anybody in. He keeps he's, he, you know it's really quite a it's a big canvas, and he's quite it's very very daring. It's very modern. And when he finally lets people in, who are other artists and critics, people he respects, mm -hmm. most of them think it's absolutely dreadful. Okay. So this is completely different yeah. from anything else he had done and anyone else had done? I think you can see elements of it, but pretty much it is a rupture with the past, yeah. It's amazing. I mean, 1907, so you, you know... Monet's still doing his water lilies. Because mm. um, there's no Ren real Master detail, is there? Like the, on the figures and things. He's just gone for it. Well, he's getting into this idea of, of what's the minimum amount of information you need that would depict an object or a person. And do you know why he did that, though? Why? Minimum. You don't know. Uh, he, he's, he's... Well, part of it is just the exploration. Mm. And... Again, he is working off the bat. You know, he's very influenced by Cezanne. He's very influenced by Renoir. And uh, so Renoir, those late nudes, which are not to everyone's tastes, one of the things about those late nudes is that on a two-dimensional plane, Renoir's trying to provide you a three-dimensional human being, right, a three-dimensional okay, yeah. object. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's something that, in fact, I think... It's true to say that the artist that Picasso had the most of in his collection was Renoir, because um, he's really intrigued by that. Cezanne, I mean, I think Cezanne is just the most amazing artist. Again, he's trying to break down what is, you know, he'll do a landscape, and he, it's, although it's extremely complicated the way that he paints, he's also trying to break it down so that, in, with some, some senses, the minimum amount of information he's giving you an impression of something, He's, you mm. know. Yeah. And in some ways, the Impressionists, although they're, they're about the way light reflects off things, but but still sometimes with the smallest bit of detail, you know it's a, I don't know, a dress or a... Mind you, that goes back. If you look closely at, you know, look closely at the pearl on the girl with the pearl earring. Yeah. You know, it's still just a, a flicker of, of white paint. And um, I mean... But the real detail on this is just the faces. The girl with the pearl earring, for example, yeah. she has no, no eyebrows. You don't no. even notice. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why she got no eyebrows? Because she didn't need eyebrows, you know. So, it's, again, it's just it's removing just, yeah, detail. Yeah, take it away. You know, if I was to paint something, I'm not a painter, but if I was to paint something, I would just think, oh, yeah, I've got to put in everything. I've got to put in yeah. the eyebrows. I've got to do this, got to do well, that. Yeah. It's what we all do. Now, of course, you know, Picasso, and, of course, you, 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 you know, abstraction... Things become so abstract, you know, sometimes you don't know what it's supposed to represent. No. But here you still just about get, don't you, that it is five. Yeah. You can imagine the reaction from the traditional conservative world Ooh. of art. They've been, what is this? Mm, 100%. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean, and, it, and you can argue it is very ugly. Um, but then although he frequented brothels, he would probably say, well, it's reality. Mm -hmm. There's an ugliness to it, which I, I suspect he was both repelled and attracted by. Yeah. Um, their faces are devoid of emotion, though, in some respects. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if I tried to paint a, photo, a, a painting like this, I'd make a right old mess of it. I could never do it. It's brilliant. You're certainly not romanticising it or no. making, you, making you think that those women no. were you to go to, you know. Ugh. They're not, they're well, not. No, it must be. There's no uh, affection in this. This no. is a business transaction. Yeah. And they're doing it because they really don't want to, but they yeah. have to. Yeah, exactly. Um, Every day just getting up. So. But of course, you know, I guess, you know, here you got, on the left-hand side, you've got that curtain. I think somewhere I read, actually, when you went in the door, there was a curtain you went through. Um, and you had to try and work out who's, who's, whose arm is whose. And... and do you know why you put the masks on well, those women and not the others? Is there a reason? He went to, and it's still there, actually, um, 
trying to remember the name of the museum. On the Seine, there is uh, a wonderful, wonderful museum of African art. Oh, okay. And he went in there and he wandered about and he was looking at these, well, looking at African art, but including mm. masks, mm. some of which were hundreds of years old. And it's one of those moments when an artist thinks, do you know what, I, I know nothing. Yeah, okay. I mean, you know, yeah, or, yeah. or everything I know has been done before by people I've never heard of. Right. Um, and he was, he, I, I think he just thought, you know, I'm going to represent that. Yeah. And, and the skill of these African artists. But the, the thing about those masks is, mm. again, sometimes they're very pared back. So it's, it's a, it's a four, it's a, you know, an eyebrow, not an eyebrow, a, um, a forehead, mm -hmm. a nose, but it's got, it's got everything there. You know, it, you obviously know it's a face, but it's got emotion. It's got power. Um, those women had to put those masks on every day to do what they had to do. And I think there's an element of that. Mm. Um, <laughs> if you put a mask on, it's just the same face every day. Oh, they're so good. I really love this. The Ethnographic Museum, that's what it's called. Oh, okay. And definitely, definitely worth a visit if you ever go to Paris, just to wander through there. Mm. Um, I'm never in... going to come out of a museum when I go in. No, I know. I'm going to be a nightmare. <laughs> I'll have the headphones on. I'm going to be like learning everything. <laughs> um, this, this, film, this, this film, this painting was actually hidden away. Oh, uh, he, he, his, the reaction was, so, it was bad. so bad. Okay, Re reaction was so mm -hmm. bad that he um, he rolled it up, and um, I think there was one. I think it came out once into somebody's studio, um, and it's I, I, I'd have to check. But so he rolled it up and put it put it to one side, and then sort of went back to doing. It's quite imagine that's quite hard to do if you've just suddenly come out with this one and then think, oh, okay, I better go back to do what everyone likes. Well, he carries on he carries on <laughs> working in this kind of abstraction way and there are you know, famous paintings that come up, you know, the the guitar and Yeah. I mean he, he the thing that I really do admire about Picasso and we worked with and filmed in the Picasso Museum in Paris. That is a fantastic museum. And what's so impressive is that every room that you go into, you're moving through his life chronologically. Yeah. He's constantly reinventing himself. Oh, right. Okay. He's con he, you know, that's what I find most impressive about him is mm -hmm. that he's, he is just, even when he's having all the different affairs and the children and the wives and the this and the that, and he's having his picture taken and he's having... The, but he is constantly absorbing stimuli, mm -hmm. which he then puts into his paintings. Yeah. He never stays still. And he, you know, he was sometimes he's he's producing one or two or three artworks a day. It mm -hmm. might be painting ceramics. It might be a canvas. It might be a drawing. It could be a, some kind of sculpture. Um, hugely prolific, and one mustn't lose that when one starts, you know, getting a bit distracted by the biography. Yeah, yeah, he had quite a, quite a life, didn't he? Um, but, yeah. So, I mean, this this painting wasn't... Um, I'm sure it's at least 10 years before it's it's actually exhibited, before anyone sees it. People still talk about the fact it was very influential, and I've, I've wondered about that. If a painting's rolled up, how can it be influential? How long do you think it was rolled up for? Well, a good, a good 10 years. Oh. But what I'm told by historians that we that I interviewed for the film was that although it wasn't exhibited, artists would have heard of it and would come by the studio. And if you, you know, if you got Picasso when you, you know, had the time mm -hmm. and you showed him a respect and an interest, then he would show it to you. Oh, OK. And artists would think, well, that's really interesting. You so know. it was one of his favourites. Yes, it was mm. one of his favourites. Um, I just love the faces. It's amazing, isn't it? Someone can just flick the brush and then suddenly the face is, I mean, it's perfect. 
It's, it's void, not a lot, not really a lot of emotion, and yet loads of emotion as to how hard it must be to do that job every day. And uh, and I, don't, I just like the ear, <laughs> like the ear there. It's like infinity. Yeah, so good. I mean, we're getting into to. I mean. Isms can be a little bit off-putting in art. And um, <laughs> if you start, you know, if, if you're not that interested, we haven't spent much time reading up about art. So that's when me. You, <laughs> well, we start hearing about surrealism and mm. cubism. Mm. And, I mean, there's so many isms. Okay. But this is cubism. Mm -hmm. And that's going back to that sense of trying to, because this is a two-dimensional flat plane. Yeah. Trying to create without, you know, breaking all the laws of perspective in one sense, but also trying to create something which feels like it's got form. Um, and also, you know, what's quite clever, what they do is the idea that you bring different... If you imagine looking around an object and then bringing different parts of it to the foreground... Right. And what it's asking of you as a viewer is you as a viewer have to start to try and make sense of this yourself. You have to do some work. Now, I really like this. I think one of the things that gets forgotten sometimes in, in, in the looking at art is the role of the viewer. There are three parties involved in any artwork. You have the artist. We always talk about the artist. And more and more these days, you know, the genius of the artist. There is the painting itself. And sometimes human forms are represented. So you've got clear kind of biographical characters. But what tends to be forgotten sometimes is the role that the viewer plays. Someone like Picasso never forgot that somebody would be looking at his painting. and he, He's making you work. Now, in the same way as when I make a film, I'm so conscious, in fact, maybe sometimes overconscious of who is it that's sitting to watch the film? What do they know already? What do mm. I need to explain to them? Yeah. Um, and you can... The trouble is you can overthink it because... You know, even in an audience of a hundred, yeah. like hundred people are arguably are all different and have different levels yeah. of understanding. But whereas in the past we've talked about how artists learnt about the way that the human eye works, or learnt about the way that we respond to colours and colour combinations, what Picasso is exploring is how your brain will make sense of what at first look, first glance might seem quite randomly. Um, you know, kind of a random assortment of, of limbs and faces, and you know, if you were to if you were to see any of these people for real, yeah, you know, they, yeah. Would, look, you know, they yeah. would look obviously very strange. Mm -hmm. um, but your brain starts to make allowances and starts to understand. But you have to look. I mean, if you look towards the bottom. You've got that leg down there, that leg that's kind of at a diagonal. You have to think, well, who, oh, who's who's, yeah. whose leg is that? Mm -hmm. um, the hand at the top, which seems rather oversized. Well, whose is that? Is it is it the mid second woman from the left? Well, no, it can't be. So it must be the first woman. And that must be representing her opening the curtain. But, I mean, it's, I don't think you could actually physically get your hand into that position. No. Well, no. via a push. No. No. Um, the woman at the bottom yeah. right, you know, she's got a, she has her back to you, but mm. her face, face is yeah. But again, it's but it's it's you almost you know, if you stare at it long enough and look at it long enough, you almost don't you forget that it's physically impossible, and you start to see them as complete characters. Is it meant to be flat? Is that what it was trying to get? Because with no perspective. Because if you actually do look at that, oh, that woman in the background there, she looks like she could now be behind the curtain. Well, now we're starting to look at it. Now you've told me to. So now you, if you start, look, <laughs> see, see, you start looking at it, then maybe she's behind another level of curtain. Uh, yeah. And woman on the in the middle mm. is clearly standing behind. I mean, there is a. Yes. If she's slightly smaller, she's slightly behind the shoulder. Um, and you, you know, you have there's, there's a little bit of classical work going on there. You've got, if you look at the bottom, you've got a triangle. Yes. And then you've got actually another triangle above it with the knees. 
And then you've got another triangle. So it's only like three pyramids, three triangles. You've got another one going up. You know, you've got this curtain, bottom left. You've got a line. Yeah. Goes up past the woman's hip. And then you've got almost, as we're looking at it, the right side of the second woman up. And you're right to the top on that arm. And then you come back down the other side. So there's a lot of pyramids and triangles going on. There are triangles within triangles. Look on the right-hand side. Look at the yeah. way the woman's arm is oh, painted. Yes. Because it's one of those things, I'm sure you've seen so, yeah. some of those artistic, yeah. you know, we think that that blue triangle on the right-hand side, our brain is telling us that that is something seen through that arm. Yeah. And the only reason we think that is because in real life, it's the kind of thing we see. But actually, that that isn't in the painting because it could be the other way around. Mm. The blue could be on the surface and the white and the pink could be behind. Yeah. But our brain's saying, no, no, it can't be that because that must be an arm and that must be behind the arm. So again, Picasso's thinking this through. He's thinking what the brain understands. So, um, yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> I know, oh, I'm going to sound really stupid now, but it's like, it's amazing that he's painting that and all the time thinking all these things. Oh yeah, all the time. And yeah. painting and overpainting. I mean, this was, this is, I'm sure, much worked. Yeah. Those faces, do you think that one was the one right at the top right was overworked? And then just Yeah. But I mean look look how he how he does that painting far right. Yeah. The, 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 that woman far right. Mm. I mean there's not barely any reality to her no. physicality at all. No. It's all sharp, you know, it's triangles and diamond shapes yeah. and lines and Yeah. But it, in, your brain's telling you it's no less realistic. You know it's a female form in the same way as perhaps, broadly speaking, the most realistic female form is the second woman along. Mm-hmm. It's got some curves to it. But even there, you know, who's got a waist like that? And Come on now, Phil. <laughs> well, what are you not, saying? Certainly not me. <laughs> We're beach body ready. Oh, yeah, I did bring cheese scones tonight. Not after that cheese scone, yeah. <laughs> Only because I let you down the other day. I didn't have any, no any pastries. <laughs> oh, oh, well, I'm, I think it's fabulous, this picture. I love it. I'm really taken with it. And you always say to me, where do your eyes go, first of all? I haven't got a clue. I don't well, that's know. interesting. I tried to it? write it down, but I just couldn't work it out. Do you know where yours went? Uh, <laughs> I closed my eyes. Yeah. And opened them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in some ways, actually, I find that that's part of the difficulty of this painting mm. is that it is kind of confusing and you don't know where to look. Uh, and maybe there's even an embarrassment, you know, because of the subject matter, which maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but certainly it's female nudity. In effect. It's not, you know, it's it's almost aggressive in some ways. Yeah. Um, but where do I look first? I don't know. Maybe that. Maybe the face of that central woman. That I find that's very. But then she's because she's confronting you. You know, she's almost daring you to look. Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. Which is then funny with the people, the women with the masks, isn't it? Yeah, and the I masks should... just really fascinate me. I must say, the Why first time I those on those two. Yeah, first time I looked at this painting, I I, I found those masks because I didn't understand what was going on. Mm. I found the masks difficult, actually. I didn't quite, I didn't get it. And I found I, it's, I was, I didn't know, I didn't realise there were masks. I just thought that he really deformed yeah. the way that he's presented those two women. I mean, there could be anything underneath. One could be really, really happy. Lady at the top. I don't think she's going to make you a cup of tea today. <laughs> For you. I don't know. I I don't know. All I know is the next time I go to art, any kind of art uh, gallery, I'm going to be a new person. <laughs> but this is a, you know, it's quite... I'm a... stop and look at all these... I'm never going to come out. I'm not. I'm going to be in there for hours. Or you know, pick five. See, I, I don't think Picasso was always a terribly nice human being. And right. actually, when you read his biography, mm. you know, artists are... Some, you know, people sometimes make excuses for artists, but... 
his treatment of women was pretty awful. Mm. And there are some terrible stories, mm. um, not just, least at this period when he he gets one woman pregnant and, and encourages her to uh, um, have an abortion. And it's not, it's all very unpleasant, really, mm. the whole story. Yeah. And, you know, he'll be with his wife and and then he'll come across a young woman that takes his fancy and... Um, and I don't think you can always excuse him. God, he was a great artist and he needed, no, the, he yes, needed this, yeah. this, that and the other. Mm. But... Nowadays, would we buy his paintings then if he was like that? Probably not. I think, I think, I think broadly speaking, if the women concerned are over 18... Yeah. ...then no one minds or they turn a blind eye or yeah. whatever. Yeah. I think where it's problematic is when judge? women are under 18. Mm. Yeah. So you have someone like Gauguin, which who is a problematic painter mm. because of, you know, his uh, um, relationships with younger women in Tahiti. Um, but so on the one hand, you have Picasso, who is throughout his life, highly sexualized, misogynist, um, badly behaved, in my opinion. This is all in my opinion, of course. But this painting is very interesting because the way that women have been presented in art in the hundreds and hundreds of years before this, um, they are, you know, there for the male gaze. Yeah. Um, you don't often have women that are standing there confronting you saying, this is who I am, deal with it. Right. Um, and I think that's part of, the, part of the discomfort that people felt in front of this painting, which was that you had women saying, okay, yeah. this, is, this, is, this is reality. Um, you know, if you want a business transaction, there's yeah. a business transaction to be had, mm -hmm. but I'm not subservient to you. Um, don't mess with me. Um, that's, that's a key part of this painting. Now, Barcelona in the nineteen hundred, uh, you know, first cent first decade of the twentieth century was an amazing place to be, and you can't deny that the drinking and the prostitution and the all the different people coming and going on ships and trains mm -hmm. and okay. I mean, it was an extraordinary place. It was a there were many artists, mm -hmm. um, all trying out new things. It was a hotbed of political thought which ultimately fed into, you know, the dreadful 1936-39 Spanish Civil War. Um, and again, I think Picasso captures that. You know, not for him, a young woman and a child walking through a field of poppies no. or, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's much mm. edgier than that. Yeah. Um, and I think while, you know, they were desperate to get to Paris, that was the centre of art, um, and they were extremely influenced by what they saw as revolutionary art in terms of the Impressionists, but the subject matter is changing. Yeah. Um, so he just... So would that be then one of the first paintings, Cubism? Yeah, I mean, this is the beginning of Cubism. Okay. And people will say that is kind of the one. Um... It's, it's exciting. It's it's the well. I mean, I could be corrected on this. I'd say it's the first cubist, partially cubist masterpiece. Okay. Um, even though, as I say, it's not really displayed until it gets. I mean, properly displayed until it gets. Um, I mean, it's almost thirty years later before it gets to MoMA. Um, and once it got to, to MoMA, then that was it. Yeah. It's up on the wall and it's staying up on the wall. Um, and did everyone go crazy then? Or had the build, had there been a build-up to it? Because people would have heard about it then. That's a good question. I, don't, I can't remember what the reaction was in, in New okay. York. It must have been good enough that they've kept it on the wall. Yeah, true. Change um, it around. And certainly people have talked about it being, you know, one of the most influential paintings of the 20th century. Um I think you can make that argument for another one of Picasso's too, which is Guernica. So again, if you look at Guernica, which is this extraordinary painting that he paints when the German Air Force bombed the Spanish 
northern Spanish town of Guernica in 1936. Arguably, I don't know, some would call it the greatest anti-war painting ever. Um, but again, it's not realistic. No. It's, it's um, yeah, there's, 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 you can see the line from this painting yeah. to that painting, which is, you know, almost 30 years later, um, where, you know, there are the, you, if you, you have to look hard at the painting and then you'll see, you know, the screaming woman or the, or whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's a complicated painting that you yeah. need to look at. Okay. Um, I need to do that one. <laughs> but again, you can see the lines going back. But just as, even though you might not make an, an immediate connection between the Impressionists and this, there are clear lines. Um, he's also, what some people, well, it's always worth remembering, he was a very, very good artist, Picasso. Oh, he's amazing. So, I mean, just... I mean, those paintings, I love the ones later on, the, the Dora Maar and all that. Yeah. I love all those. And yeah. They were the ones I didn't know of course as always but definitely have seen but even but even her you know his application of paint here is he's again that's that's come from the study yeah. where those years in barcelona and madrid where he's going to the galleries he's learning how van gogh painted he's learning how monet painted he's learning how velazquez painted he's learning how goya painted so you can see here in his application of paint mm-hmm. um no, if you look at the curtain, I mean, you don't tend to look too hard at the curtains. But if you look at the curtains, they're very beautifully painted. Yeah. I love the colours, though, of the whole painting. And that, too, yeah. You'd have thought very, very hard about mm. its colour combinations. They're just gorgeous. So, I mean, I tell you, yeah. I love the way it kind of washes from one side to the other. And it's just so, that I do, oh, yeah. As you know, I make a couple of quilts sometimes, so I always see um, fabrics. Mm. So, mm. it'll make a lovely quilt. <laughs> you picked out some shapes and found those colours. Mm. Yeah, I'm in. So it's definitely one to make a beeline for. Actually, talk about colours, it's quite interesting. In, the, in, in MoMA... The way that it's hung is on the left-hand side, you've got the windows onto a street, throwing in some natural daylight, which is blue in hue. On the right-hand side, it's all the day, all the light from the from the um, gallery's own light sources, okay. which has a more orange hue to it. So actually, and it may not notice in, in with your own eye, but certainly with a camera, you can notice how there's it kind of got a blue hueish blue hue to the left and an orange hue to the right. And in a way, it just adds to the painting, just adds to the energy of the painting. So someone's really thought that out as well then? No, I think that's just by chance. Oh, really? I don't think they thought that out at all. Um, Stroke of luck then. But I mean, here clearly that, you know, the the, the colour combination, I mean, orange and, orange and blue are obviously oh. colour combination that people often work with. Mm. If you're a bit boldy, you might go for reds and greens. Mm-hmm. You know, the... But um, and also with blue, broadly speaking, and Leonardo is a good example of this. Blue is felt to, to depict distance; it kind of recedes into the distance. And you'll find that artists tend to use reds in the foreground and blues in the background. And again, that's probably an understanding of how our brain works. That maybe when we see something on a flat plane, yeah, that actually. Something that's red jumps out at us and something that's blue sits back. So you'll notice with, with Leonardo, you almost, don't, you almost don't notice, but with Leonardo's paintings, the landscapes in the background, and they often are more in the background than this, are a pale blue. But it does, it means you think, you know, it feels like it's going back hundreds and hundreds of metres. OK, well, I'm going to write that down then. So Monet, so Claude, <laughs> so Claude, well, Claude Monet, for example. Yeah. Fascinating. I mean, he when he planted, what I love about Monet, because he was a gardener as much as a painter, so when he plants his gardens in Giverny mm-hmm. in the autumn, he's bought all these various bulbs and flowers and he knows what colour they should be. Yeah. But he plants them colour-coded. Mm-hmm. And broadly speaking, 
obviously there are exceptions, but broadly speaking, he'll have the pinks and the reds to the foreground and the blues to the background. Um, I once um, suggested this to, you know, my wife, Amanda, that, that we should, you know, when we sit on the balc on the deck of our house yeah. and we're planting, you know, we're thinking about flowers and, and plants in the garden, we should have the, the reds and the pinks closer to us and the blues in the distance. So here... Well, you've done first... all right then, haven't you? Because if you look outside your window, there's a lovely oh, pink yeah, tomatoes, which I said about today exactly. as, I, as I walked in. But you now this, know why. But look at this painting. <laughs> yes. Your brain, your brain is telling you, isn't it, that the 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 you know the orangey pink of those ladies is in the mm. foreground. Yeah. Okay. Now close your eyes. Start again, and look at it, and imagine that the blue is in the front. Okay. And all of a sudden, it gets kind of strange. Yeah. If you imagine that's in the foreground, mm-hmm. and the women are, st- yeah, it just just doesn't work. No. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, I'm pleased my brain's on the same page as yours, Phil. I feel good today. And I mean, if you imagine, imagine that if it wasn't bl- those kind of shades of grey and blue, imagine if you'd done that as, I don't know, a bold green mm. or a yellow. Mm. And in some ways, of course, that you could argue that would be more... Actually, that's the next step. Yeah. Where you start really playing with things or just doing complete blocks of colour. So you still... You know, these artists, they kind of move. I mean, this is a jump, and everyone says, you yeah. know, most significant painting in the 20th century, blah, mm, blah, blah. Mm. But still, you can see this is the start of a progression where you end up with blocks of colour. You end up with Mondrian, for example, or yeah. Howard Hodgkin, oh. or, you know, whoever, yeah. where, you know, that blue area between the third and the fourth and fifth ladies is just one flat plane of yellow right and maybe up here is like and then it starts well we've got these planes and then maybe it starts becoming just squares and i mean it's 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 now there's no reason why anyone should like this painting when we interviewed the curator for the film she was absolutely brilliant and she said look whether you like it or not yeah just look at it Mm. try to understand it and even if you have a reaction to it that's good but don't ignore it right that's brilliant i love that i think that's probably Mm. A good place to conclude, you mm. know, whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. And I know plenty of people think. I'm going to say, what do most people? Most people do they like it? Do you know? Or it's hard to, I don't mm. know most people. No, that's hard true. To answer that. I like it. I think. I think. I never really looked at it before. I think a lot of people will, look. The most popular painting, was in Britain, <laughs> on one poll recently was the skate, oh. the skating vicar. Oh no! Not another one. I don't know, please. <laughs> And um, you keep doing that to me. That was like the turnaround. No, you'll beginning. know the skating vicar. I do know. I think. I think I do. On the ice, on the ice, on the on the frozen lake. And who's um, we, that was another poll? Was it just recently? I don't know when that was from. <laughs> um, and like sunflowers, you know, our film about sunflowers. Yes. You know, one of the reasons that painting is so popular is because it's so easy to understand. It's a big, it's a vase of yellow sunflowers. Yeah, that's yeah. You got to work a little harder. This, like, what yes, is going yes. on? Yeah. Well, you have, and you you said you have to stop and stare, you have to take mm. a glance, no, don't glance, look more. Yeah. But now you have to go, and, you definitely have to go into an art gallery if you know what's going to be in there. Oh, and oh, pick oh, maybe five oh, paintings. Or see, see it in a film. Obviously, obviously see it in a film. No, but yeah, if you I, do your film first, 100%. I would, but if you took, pick five paintings now before you go into an art gallery. Definitely. And try and know some stories. I think, I mean, I think you can't go into the National Gallery as no. well. well I've just, definitely you, not done the right thing. I've definitely not done that in my life. I think sure. you go and you you pick three paintings. Yeah. But listen, I'm working with a guy now who's really interesting, who is an expert on one particular painter. And he will sit in front of that painting for an hour. Really? I'm too fidgety. I couldn't do that. No. But he will look... So talking to him about a painting is absolutely fascinating because he's seeing details and relationships between details and he's seeing things which you only get by looking yeah. really really hard and um he so, talked to me about certain paintings five times in right. the last month oh, wow. the same painting and it's so much detail but totally you know he's, he, I, I totally get it and you just realize in this particular case, how hard that painter 
nothing is an accident. No. And um, <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. Now, sometimes a painting should just bring you immediate pleasure. Yeah. You know, you, no one yeah. wants to work. But this is... Like you said about the sunflowers. <laughs> just look at the sunflowers. Yeah. Lovely. So the sunflowers can work on so many levels. It can just be... And, and because uh, Van Gogh knew this, it could just be a nice picture to brighten up a wall yep. that his mate Paul Gauguin could enjoy in his little bedroom in Arles. <laughs> or it's yep. a painting that tells you about the history of flowers and their relationship with painters. Or it's about Van Gogh's own biography and how he's trying to find optimism and energy and light and, you know... Yeah. I'm in a new world. I really am. So, anyway, yeah. Picasso. When you said about doing this, I didn't know I was going to be anywhere near this. No, ah, it's also, it's also it's so, much, so good. so much history involved. Yeah. Too, isn't there? yeah. I don't know what I've been doing all my life. <laughs> Not looking at paintings, for sure. Well... I bet that guy must be so interesting, though, if he sat and looked at so many paintings. The trouble is I forget names about everything and stuff like that. Oh, That's so annoying. We all do. Okay, good. Oh, my God, yes. Okay. But, yeah, like, but, like yeah, but that's the thing, to go to a gallery and mm. just think... I mean, it involves a bit... It's like anything. If you put a bit of work in, you get more out. So yeah. you think, I'm going to go to... I don't know. I'll tell you a really good gallery in London, if you're in London, is the Wallace Collection. Uh-huh. That is fantastic. I mean, it has a famous painting, The Laughing Cavalier. But there's plenty of other... I mean, it's got everything. It's got armour and amazing... Oh, it's just got so much in there. It's a real treasure chest. Yeah. But either just turn up and maybe there's an audio guide and just just go and look at five things. Yes. I think that's what I have to do. Actually, I did this the other day. Mm. I went to the Ashmolean in Oxford and... I was just going to wander around and, and look at as much as I could. And then I thought, actually, what I'm going to do is follow the, I don't know if it's the director's tour, but they've got like a tour of key objects because they know too that people yes. can't look at everything. No. And that was really interesting to just say, oh, I'm not going to look at everything. I'm just going to look at these. No, I did get distracted quite a lot on the way. But... Or just by look, other things. By other things. Okay. Because it's so, it is, yeah. it is fantastic. The Ashmolean is just great. If I lived in Oxford, I would definitely go in there every week. Oh. So much in there. Oh, that's nice. Um, but I did look at just specific objects and try to... But then there comes a point when you need either the audio guide, which I didn't have, actually. I had a, I had a catalogue, but actually that's a bit cumbersome looking up things in the yeah. catalogue. Um, or you need... So, so, like we do in the film, you need some, an expert telling you. Yes. Um, so we need to start going out... <laughs> Going on tours with experts. With experts. Um, <laughs> no. But we did do oh, one. Was lovely. Was lovely. We do one thing in the. Fi- oh, I won't tell you actually. You have to watch the film. Okay. We, we do one unusual. When we show this film in the film, when we show this painting in the film, we do something unusual. Okay. I'll which, watch it um, which absolutely encourages you to to look. Right. Okay. On that. That's it. All right. Until next week. Get to the art galleries. Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at seventh-art.com or contact us by emailing info at seventh-art.com. See you next time.